Hey, everyone coming in now. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. My name is Paige Berger, and I'm here broadcasting from Barrett Bookstore in Darien, Connecticut, with my behind the scenes events coordinator, Rosanna Nissen who is manning the chat and the tech side of things. And of course, our distinguished guests, Dory Greenspan and Julia Tertian, who don't worry, they're here, but you can't see them yet. We're going to bring them on in a moment and let people uh, give them a moment to arrive. I also wanna say a big thank you to our partner, Darian Library, who has been a great support for tonight's program. We have such a lovely crowd here tonight, big numbers registered, and we're, we're, of course, so thrilled to hear from Dory and Julia. And we're also, on a personal note, glad to be back with you after a bit of a break. This is the first virtual event that Barrett Bookstore has done in um, a few months, and for those of us who have joined us before, you will see that um, we have transitioned from our lovely relationship with Crowdcast over to Zoom. So uh, bear with us if there are any technical snafus on our maiden journey, but I'm sure it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. For those of you who are not familiar with Barrett Bookstore, we are in our 82nd year of business and we're so grateful for the community's support to help ensure that we stick around for many years to come. Tonight, we are here to celebrate the release of Baking with Dory, Sweet, Salty, and Simple, a beautiful cookbook that is destined to become an instant classic. You guys are getting a sneak peek. In fact, I'll show you that sneak peek. This is the advanced copy, definitely not for sale, but this book will release next week, and we have many signed copies heading our way. Um, so feel free to go ahead and pre-order on our website. Rosanna will post that link throughout the evening and we'll have your copy ready for you here at the store or ship it to you wherever you're watching us from tonight. We also have lots of copies of Julia's latest cookbook, Simply Julia, and she has kindly offered to send us um, signed book plates for these. So um, we can absolutely get those in your hands as well. Well, I also want to note before introducing our guests that we will have time for Q&A tonight. Um, that's located at the bottom of your screen. So if at any point you have questions that you want to ask our guests, go ahead and pop them in there. And toward the end of the program, uh, we'll have the opportunity to ask our guests some questions. And now to introduce our guests. Dory Greenspan is the New York Times bestselling author of 14 cookbooks. She has five James Beard Awards, one for journalism, one for baking with Julia, one for baking from my home to yours, one for Dory's cookies, and one for being voted into the who's who of food and beverage in America. She's won the Cookbook of the Year Award from the International Association of Culinary Professionals twice. Dory is, of course, a columnist for the New York Times Magazine. She lives in New York City, Westbrook, Connecticut, and Lucky Lady, Paris. Julia Tertian is a New York Times bestselling author. Her latest cookbook, Simply Julia, is a national bestseller and has received praise from the New York Times, Vogue, Eater, and many more. She's also the author of the celebrated cookbooks Now and Again, Feed the Resistance, and Small Victories. She hosts and produces um, an award-winning podcast called Keep Calm and Cook On. She has co-authored numerous cookbooks and has written for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Vogue, Bon Appetit, and Food and Wine, and more. She sits on the Kitchen Cabinet Advisory Board for Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, is a member of God's Love We Deliver Culinary Council, and is the founder of Equity at the Table, an inclusive digital directly of women and non-binary individuals in food. Julia lives in the Hudson Valley with her wife and pets. She is currently working full-time at Long Season farm and if i can make this tech work correctly we are going to welcome them on now hi dory hi it worked it we worked it. Hi, okay. Yay, we did it all right i am gonna get lost and leave the stage to you both thank you for being here thank, thank you, you so, so much. much hi dory hi julia so <laughs> Last time I saw you, you had just written um, Simply Julia. If we, it, we've got to figure out a way that we can see one another when we're not writing books. <laughs> is, that, is that a time that exists for you? Are you ever not writing a book? I, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but, but, but it's a kind of dramatic way to finally get together um, and yeah. love 
thank you for, thank you for doing this. Oh my gosh. It is so my pleasure. And you were kind enough to do this for me a few months ago. And I must say, I really love being on this side of the conversation <laughs> and I have so many questions for you, but most of all, I just want to start to say congratulations on another just wonderful book. And, you know, you're, you're just, I don't know, your longevity is just amazing. And this is your 14th cookbook, 14. your, your 14th cookbook, and it marks 30 years of you being a cookbook author. Yeah, my first and you're only 35. <laughs> um, it, it, when I when I realized that it was 30 years, yeah, Sweet Times came out in 1991. And actually, when I wrote um, Everyday Dory, which was my last book, um, and it came out 2018, mm-hmm. I said, that's it. Third mm-hmm. book, Baker's Dozen. Baker's Dozen, that would be nice. But, but we are. What, mm. what made you feel like I've got another? What was, what happened? This is the, oh, so book 14, and maybe the first book that has an, a real origin story. I mean, mm-hmm. there, I, I guess the, the Julia, you know, baking with Julia, but I had decided I was going to start thinking about different projects. And we were in Santa Barbara at a wedding. And in the morning, I went off to get some coffee and I got this beautiful scone. I took a picture of it and I put it on Instagram and as one does. And Anne Ma, um, a friend and an author, DM'd me immediately and said, you know, you should write a savory baking book. And I got that kind of, do you get, when you have a, when there's a good idea, do you get- A tingle. Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of like all tingly and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm going to do it. And that's how it started. It didn't turn out to be a savory book, but that's how it started. Yeah, but that was the origin, was was the scone in Santa Barbara. Exactly. Do you, not to just jump ahead before we've even like talked about this book, but have you had that feeling about another book or are you working on number 15 or you are just enjoying this moment or what's going on right now? I'm not working on number 15. I am enjoying this moment (laughs) and I started a newsletter. So, you know, so I'm, 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 I'm busy. I'm writing a lot. Um, Yeah. So that, that brings up, I have so many questions I want to ask you about logistics, you know, both you and I, I think take, I can't speak for you, but I think this is true. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think we take a lot of pleasure in writing recipes, in writing recipes people can really trust. So I think that we think about details and the order of events and this kind of stuff. And so my mind, when I have the opportunity to speak to you on this occasion, my mind goes to logistics of just like, how does it all happen? What's the recipe? And as you just mentioned, you have your new newsletter, you, you, you know, you write for the times, like you're a very busy, you're a busy person. (laughs) So can you take us through, I know right now you're in like book promotion time, which as authors, this isn't like our normal time. (laughs) This is like a very special occasion. So, you know, take me back, I don't know, two months ago or like a month from now, what is like a typical Thursday for you? Do you have one? So, so my husband is, I'm in the kitchen and my husband's just a little distance away from me. And you said, take us through a typical Thursday. And there was this little giggle, (laughs) a little bit like a snort. Um, because I don't, so I look more organized than I am. I've always, Mm -hmm. my hair, it's the scarf. I look like, you know, the glasses. Um, I don't really have typical days. I've tried. I've tried to say, okay, I'm going to write in the morning until Mm -hmm. one o'clock in the afternoon, or I'm going to, this will be a day that I'm totally in the kitchen. But I work rather happy. Hazard. Mm-hmm. So my desk is just a little bit past where Michael is. It's one big room. So it's kitchen and office and then dining room. And I'll be sitting at my desk and I'll be writing and I'll have an idea. I think, oh, you know, maybe I could 
you know, maybe I could put cardamom in a, mm-hmm. and, and I jump up and I start working. So I have no, I have no typical day. And when I, when I tried, it's been kind of nice to know what you're going to do for the day, but mm-hmm. stick with me. Do you have a yeah. typical I know for you, but yeah, I'm, I'm having this funny chapter in my life right now where I've been working at a vegetable farm because I wanted some routine in my life, which I haven't had. I wanted someone else to be in charge and I wanted a break from, from, you know, working on cookbooks and I just really wanted to be outside and I have fallen in love with lawn mowing. (laughs) It's like my favorite thing to do. Um, I feel like I'm like, mowing a lawn is like cutting off the crests of things <laughs> like I'm just neatening up all the edges so I'm really enjoying it but anyway when I'm just doing my sort of cookbook work I am you know we talked about this a bit a few months ago and it's it's really stuck with me it's so interesting because I think in many ways I'm a lot like you where I've attempted routine I'm attracted to routine but it doesn't really work for me <laughs> I have trouble doing it on my own. Um, But it really, one thing that really stayed with me was I was sharing with you that my process for books is I write the entire table of contents before I write recipes. I I basically draw the map for this little city I'm going to try and build. And you don't do this. So tell us a little how that comes together for you. No, but you said something that was so interesting then. You said, oh, uh, that you're the architect right? And mm-hmm. what did you call me? You're, you're an artist. You're like a true artist. Well, I don't know about true or I don't even know about artist, but I thought that was such, no, but that was such an interesting way mm-hmm. of seeing it. I don't know what my book is going to look like until I'm almost finished. Mm-hmm. So I have these moments where I jump up and add cardamom or mm-hmm. I'm on a recipe and I think, what if, what if I, and I keep working, working like that until I realize that I'm actually on a project that has to end and have, be cohesive and somewhere middle three quarters of the way in, I start looking at what I have mm-hmm. and seeing how it takes shape. I would not for anybody out there who wants to get started in what Julia Child called cookbookery, mm-hmm. but, Julia's example, not mine. <laughs> I don't know. It seems to be working for you. How how do you keep track of all these moving parts? Pencil and paper. So and you I, have like folders? Like what I <laughs> here's my notebook. Okay, notebooks. Here's my pencil. Like That's... I need to go any place without it. Wow. I do it, it, once I start, so I work. I work in a notebook. I work my recipes out in a notebook and then I'll, um, I'll write them and I'll try to write the head notes so that, you know, I'm not left with a hundred stories to tell all in a row, which is for anyone who's like, what does that mean? It's like the introduction to the recipe. So it's, you know, recipe title, introduction, ingredients, directions. Mm -hmm. And I try and do that all at once. And then I send it off to a recipe tester, to Mary Dodd, my tester. And um, I want Mary to test the formula, you know, does it work? And the language, was she Mm -hmm. to follow these directions? Then when I get that back, I start putting it. (laughs) Sometimes it just said like, you know, baking with Dory and there were 50 recipes. And I thought, okay, time to say baking with Dory breakfast uh-huh move the brioche in. I just somehow as I said I, it's hard for me to describe I wouldn't recommend it <laughs> worked it worked 14 times yeah amazing tell me a little bit if 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 you will about Mary Dodd you you mentioned her in the book you've like mentioned her in the newsletter and so you just said this is who tests all your recipes how did you two first connect and what role does she play in your kind of creative farmers work? Market. She stopped me in the farmer's market. She had two, her kids were tiny. Her boys were tiny and they're just, they're very close in age. And she had both of them. She was kind of wrangling them. And she said, I live in the neighborhood. I'm a baker, um, a home baker. She said, I belong to, there was a group that started. It's still going 
in 2007, after baking from my home, TRS came out called um, Tuesdays with Dory, and they baked every Tuesday from my book. And Mary said, and I'm a member of Tuesdays with Dory. And if you need anything, I'm just so, I live so close to you. Just give me a call. And I thought, I'm fine. Thank you. I don't need anything. I, you know, I'm just fine. And about a week or two later, there was a video crew here and somebody who was supposed to help with the food didn't show up. And mm. I, I had Mary Dodd's number in my pocket. Amazing. She, right. And I picked it up. I called, oh, can you come? Now, really, when we think about it, she had, you know, a two and a three-year-old. How did she show up? But that's Mary Dodd. So Mary came. She was so fabulous. We finished. She worked with us for like 11 days. We oh, finished. Wow. Yeah. She said, you know, you need help. <laughs> And I said, I'm fine. I'm real. She said, no, you're not. She said, tell you what, let me work with you for a month. And then if it doesn't work out, that was 10 years ago. I couldn't. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really, that's a really inspiring story. I'm re- very inspired by Mary and her, like her chutzpah. That's awesome. Well, and she's, you know, Mary is wonderful. She's super competent. She's a really good tester. And she was, if I, if I had known I wanted a Mary Dot, that's the, I would have described Mary Dot. She's because she's a home cook. She's a home baker. Mm -hmm. She, she's got kids. She feeds the soccer team, you know, so she knows what a recipe is going to work for people. Somebody just wrote, oh, it's Joel. Hi, Joel. (laughs) Hi, Joel. I love Mary. Um, She, she's, you know, she'll, she'll dial me back, you know, this Mm -hmm. really need an extra, whatever it is, because she's a home baker. And as you say earlier, um, you and I write for home bakers and home cooks. Absolutely. That's so valuable to have her perspective. And do you think having someone like that, I'm asking because I experienced on my last book, I, I used to test all my own recipes. I continue to do that. And then I share them with family and friends. Mm-hmm. And on my most recent book, my wife, Grace, she was going through like a career transition moment. She had some time and she tested all of my recipes for me. And it, it changed the work for the better because I had someone who wasn't me right in front of me making this stuff and saying, this doesn't make sense. And someone who wasn't afraid to tell me when I was a little bit off, which it sounds like Mary kind of offers that. So does, does that kind of thing happen for you? Like, does she, do you feel like she enhances your work in that way? It sounds like she does. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, by the time I give Mary a recipe, I've worked on it. I've made it several times. I think it's solid. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just a small thing. So Mary's very proud of herself because she convinced me to use baking spray. (laughs) It's one of the, one of her triumphs. She said, you know, really nobody wants to butter a pan, Uh flour it, tap out the flour, have the flour go everywhere. Oh yeah. But Mary said, you know, you could take parchment paper and you do this. So, so tomorrow in the newsletter, I'm going to have Julia's recipe for the pear, polenta and almond cake. And you, it's, it's such a good cake. And you do this in the recipe. So you take parchment and you just take a strip of it and you line the bottom of the pan and you let the excess hang over. Mm-hmm. So you use it as a sling. It handles. Mm-hmm. Right yeah. to- and I kept saying, you don't need that. You can just turn it over. And Mary said, you know, not everybody is as brave as you. <laughs> would like to just lift their cakes out and put them down and not worry about, you know, the corn. Yeah. So sometimes it's just very small stuff that changes the way I think about something. That makes a difference. And shows up in the, in the recipe. Yeah, yeah, that's so wonderful. Yeah. Well, speaking of, of bravery, I, I've been thinking about how long your career has been, how long it continues to be, and the fact that you started making 
your work when when just the media landscape was in a very different place, including there was no social media. And I have really, from the outside, admired how you have engaged with social media. And I'm using bravery as my segue here because I think it's brave to put yourself out there, you know, and to put your work out there. And you do that in your books and you do it on social media. And I'm just curious for you, it seems to me that you have a lot of fun with it. Is that, is that yes. accurate? Is it fun for you? It's fun until, until there's something that very difficult, but mostly, yeah. mostly, yeah. It's, mostly it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like, I, I feel like since you kind of entered the, you know, the scene before, I think it, it, there was a feeling that like you had to be on social media. Did you ever consider not partaking? So this is one of the things about being old, right? So, because I started, so yes, it was 30 years ago that my first book came out, but I was writing for magazines and mm -hmm. newspapers, you know, before that. And, and, and like, for instance, my first book, I wrote it and I sent it to my mother, even though I knew she never use it um she had it bound in plastic like some precious you know um but but you know okay so I knew my mom had a copy but we knew nothing we just sent work out into the world when the internet came along um I was thrilled by it I was so excited I didn't of course I didn't see what would happen but so after I started when did I start my blog I think so Baking with Dory started, I, Tuesdays with Dory started, I think, I think it was 2007, 2008. And, and before that, there was a, a website, a group called eGullet. And people, mm -hmm. right, there would be channels. Yeah, I remember that, it. Right? They would talk about, they'd have questions, there were people who would answer. And one day I'm sitting in my office in New York, and I'm looking at eGullet, and I see a picture of one of my recipes. And I started to cry. Mm. I was so excited. I'd never, you know, we just take this for granted. Yeah. The only way I would have seen it is if, you know, a friend of mine made a bun cake of mine for brunch and I was invited. To see your work, to see that somebody was mm -hmm. making your recipe was thrilling to me. Yeah. And so after Tuesdays with Dory started, I started a blog as a way to be in touch with readers and mm -hmm. cooks and I loved it I loved yeah. the sense of to me it was magical you know I, I'm not a you know I'm not a native I, you know a native mm -hmm. loser yeah and I still feel that way the idea that that we can be in touch that we can develop communities um yeah. it's I mean it's exciting and you I just I feel like you you engage with it in such a, a positive way. And I, I get such a sense from you when I read your work, when I see, you know, just the things you share on social media um, and just, you know, in the opportunities I have to talk with you, I get such a clear sense of the things that excite you. <laughs> it seems, you know, like community online or tasting a scone at the bakery in Santa Barbara. Like, it seems like you find excitement all the time. Do you agree with that? <laughs> I, I, yes, I do. Agree. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I thought you were going someplace else. Right? I, was, I was going to, but then I was like, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> so like... You're not wrong. And I think, but you know, I feel like I could say the same thing about you. Hmm. I think that the work that we do, the possibilities for what for our work are mm -hmm. all around us yeah and yeah. that seeing them is and realizing that we can make something out of what we've just encountered that mm -hmm. we, that's that's exciting that yeah. keeps me going and I have a feeling that it's pretty great for you totally too. totally you know like a question I get asked a lot I'm sure you've been asked a million times is like what inspires you and to me that question I mean it's always worth asking but I feel like everything <laughs> is everywhere, right? So I, t 
told this story recently, and you know, stop me if you've heard this before, <laughs> but um, years ago, like before we had the year 2000, um, I had written a book with Pierre Hermé, a, a Paris pastry chef, and we were at a signing and a woman came up. I only recently discovered that he knew who she was, but she came up and she's carrying a little baby in her arms. And Pierre gets up and kind of, you know, tweaks the baby's cheeks and mm-hmm. says, baby, what's the baby's name? Baby's name was Celeste. And he took, he had a little pad that he always kept with him in his breast pocket. And he took it out and he wrote down the name Celeste. And I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I don't know. I just like the name. Wow. And five, six, eight years later, he did an entire collection of desserts and pastries and named them Celeste. Wow. And I too had asked him, I said, where do, where do your ideas come from? And he said what you said, everywhere. Yeah. And meeting that baby and writing down that name for me was, you know, an example of everywhere. Yeah. That's, I love that. I love that. I feel like you have had pretty amazing teachers. And I think you are an amazing teacher. The way you write your recipes, the way you share about baking. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of people here tonight who in the year 2021 have voluntarily joined a Zoom <laughs> on a weeknight <laughs> to hear you talk about your book, right? You know, there's- <laughs> Thank <it's>, you all. <laughs> like, I think, and I think the reason so many of us are here, myself included, is because we've learned so much from you. You are such a good teacher. And hearing that story and how you've held on to it, knowing, you know, your your work and relationship with Julia Child, I'm just wondering if you could tell us, maybe it's one of them or someone else, but could you tell us a bit about like who have been your most meaningful teachers? Michael just said, that's a tough question. <laughs> It really is. So I feel like, you know, so I, I, I started to cook and bake. I had no training, um, but I had great, but you're right. I had great. Mm -hmm. Um, I started to cook and bake by reading cookbooks. And so maybe heaters books Mm -hmm. were Bibles for me. And when I got interested in France and French cuisine and French pastry. The early get the the first book by Gaston Lenotte that was translated into English. I worked my way all through it, and then then I just got so lucky. I mean, I got to work with so many great chefs who were generous, who would let me you know stand next to them and watch what they did and ask questions. And I always had my mm-hmm. my paper. So I got to work with Danielle Goulou. I got to work with Pierre. I worked with Jean-Georges von Gerstein and his first pastry chef in New York. Um, Julia, 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 Pierre Hermé. Yes. I mean, I, and I said bravery before, but social media, yeah, social media doesn't take bravery. What took bravery and what was really hard for me was saying yes. Mm. Because I was always scared. Mm. I was always afraid. I was always, I mean, to, to work with Julia, to work with Pierre, I just thought, no, I can't. And then just the, the desire to learn, mm-hmm. the wanting to know overcame that fear. Mm. And I always said yes. I was always scared, but I always said yes. And I always learned so much. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. So again, stop me if I've told you this. But <laughs> no, I think about this every day. Julia, the other Julia. Not me. <laughs> it's something, but I think it's something that you could have said. So I was working with Julia and we had, we, we played hooky. We took a little time off one afternoon. We went <laughs> supermarket that was her idea of of a good afternoon off and she said to me we're so lucky and she said we're so lucky because we work in food and Mm. that's when we never stop learning 
Absolutely. I totally feel that way. Absolutely. And so because I just spent some time with, can you see all my little, (laughs) (laughs) I didn't realize which book it was when you held it up. Um, And and because I made the paracolonta and um, and, I'm I've got yours with me. Um, I've got many of yours behind me. <laughs> I had the actually small victory spell on my head yesterday. <laughs> right here. I don't um, know what to say I'm about that. Against you. I'm not, <laughs> that's not your fault. Are you okay? I'm okay. Okay. Um, now I forgot what I was going to tell. Oh, because of, because I, I made your, your parent polenta and pear polenta and almond cake. I love the, the, the way your titles are. Um, and to write about it for the um, XOXO Dory newsletter, I was really looking at the recipe in terms of how you write a recipe, Mm. how you find moments, lines in the recipe where you can help the reader, the cook, the baker to succeed, Mm -hmm. how you describe things, the, the permission that you give people to make a change here and there not to worry about something um the way in this cake you use pear baby food (laughs) ready made you don't have to cook the pears right right there right it's right there um and it does give great texture to the cake and as a as someone who writes recipes to read someone else's recipe um and find all of this it's wonderful and mm. it's the way you care about home cooks it's a very generous um wanting and, and we may have talked about this before but i think we both want the same thing for home cooks and home bakers we want them to be successful yeah that's yeah. the whole point of writing absolutely food. absolutely and i i definitely well that's very kind and i thank you for that <laughs> and you know, I really, I, I feel the same about, about your work. And I, I feel reading it just as a reader or as a, someone baking one of your recipes, I feel like you are rooting for me and that feels really good. <laughs> and I'm but, sure a lot of people here tonight know exactly what I'm talking about. But I feel that way. I feel yeah. like, you know, what is, what is my job? If I'm writing a book and you're going to you know, you're going to buy the book, you're going to mm-hmm. take it to your house, you're going to put it on your shelf, you won't get hit in the head. <laughs> yeah. Wear a helmet. <laughs> Wear a helmet. It was a big stack and I was just pulling it. Um, but if, 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 you, if you buy a book, if you, even if you, you make a recipe that you've, you know, found online, you as the home baker, the home cook, you're trusting us. Mm-hmm to lead you mm-hmm. down the right path, you, to have you make something that you'll enjoy making the actual process of making it and sharing it with people. And I think that once again, wanting wanting you all out there, I wish I could see you, I wish we were together, I know. Um, to be successful. That's what our job is, yeah. is to, you know, encourage you to come into the kitchen, encourage mm-hmm. the book and to share. Um, and, you know, it's kind of selfish not to do that. You, you write a little in the introduction to this book about, about kind of this, about what we're talking about, because you talk about how baking has, you know, made your life better, how it's changed your life. And, um, this might be maybe a strange question. I don't know. But when you are standing in your kitchen, what you're doing right now, when you're in that space, but you're not on Zoom, you are just Dory, you know, on your own and you're baking. How do you feel? What is the feeling like in your body? It, it's a, it's quiet. Mm. There's something, and I feel... So when I, before I started writing cookbooks, baking was kind of my solace. Baking Mm -hmm. 
something I did at the end of a really difficult day. Baking was something I did to sort out other parts of my life. Um, and now, all these years later, even when it's what I do mm -hmm. every day, as a career, I still feel that. I yeah. still, once I start, once I have ingredients, once I'm touching ingredients, mm. once I can smell the ingredient, once something goes into the oven and the, the kitchen is filled with that mm. aroma, that's, I have, that, that, that's magical. It's satisfying. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's what I want to be doing. Yeah. I feel yeah. lucky to have this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. I I'm right with you. <laughs> Speaking of, of magical, um, how I can only imagine how your life has changed now that you're a grandmother, how has it impacted your work or has it? Um, it has and hasn't. So, um, it's, so I made a birthday. So J my granddaughter. back up. <laughs> so my granddaughter's name is Gemma. Gemma Tao Greenspan. She is I don't. I mean, you all of you out there, you may have children, grandchildren, neighbors. Mine's cutest. Just saying, right. So she's completely adorable, and she has not had. She had not had sugar, and Linlin, mom, said to me. We'll, she'll have sugar for her first birthday. And so I made a birthday cake for her. I made tiny little cakes and she loves strawberries and I put a strawberry in the center. And for me, it, I, I, making that cake and thinking back to all of the birthday cakes that I had made for our son, Joshua, mm -hmm. and thinking how the cake, by the way, she didn't love it. Just, <laughs> just, just so we get this out of the way. Um, but, mm. I, but I loved it. I yeah. loved knowing that I was making something for her that, that marked a real milestone and that this little cake would be part of her life in some way. That when Lindley and Joshua say to her, well, now, of course, there are pictures of everything, but say, you know, your first birthday, mm. your made you this little cake. I don't think she liked the texture. I think it was it was a little cake and it had a little white um white chocolate dip. Uh-huh. It's also 94 degrees. And so it was a little melty. And I think she couldn't quite I wanted to make it small so that she could grab it herself and it does it <laughs> I mean you'll have many more opportunities. <laughs> I I mean it's so funny to me that she didn't love it. I'm sure she appreciated it. Well, it, we'll have to find, and we may never know. But it's, I think of that as I'm, because I love her so much. Sometimes when I'm working, I'm thinking, I can't wait mm. until I can do this with Gemma. Yeah. And I put her, when, when she's here visiting, she's on a high chair, that, a thingamajig. Mm -hmm that hooks to the counter. Sure, yeah. You know, so I'll make things and she'll be focused and I'll just like give her things to touch, like, you know, feel the orange peel or, um, you know, hold, I even, you know, let it, like feel the sugar and the salt mm -hmm. in the bowl. I'm so looking forward. Yeah. Yeah. That must feel just talk about excitement, but I, I would just love to be a fly on the wall with the two of you baking together when she's old enough. That's so sweet. <laughs> um, what, where, I'm trying to think. Okay. You, you live in many places. I was trying to think how to phrase that. <laughs> and I get a sense of, that was so evocative, what you just described, how you feel when you're baking and even describing like what you give to Gemma to feel and touch and the textures and all of that. And I'm wondering in all of these places that you, you call home and you spend time in with your life sort of in these different places, like what, what makes you feel most at home or like what comes to mind just when I say, Oh, it's easy. 
having people, uh, you know, having having people around the table, making mm-hmm. food. That's, you know, so I, I, I don't think of myself as living in many places. I think of myself as having three kitchens. <laughs> but <laughs> but so Paris is one place where I have a kitchen. And because of COVID, we were away from home, Paris home, for 500 days. And I thought that when I saw the Eiffel Tower from the air, you know, I would cry or when we landed or when we opened the door. I cried when I got to the market mm. and thought, you know, Twiggy, who, who, who's the cheesemonger. I cried when I got into the kitchen with the food that I had bought at the market and mm-hmm. I was going to see friends. Yeah. Making food for people, sharing. And, and, and I know that I write all about food, but that's not the important part of it. The important part is that there are people to share the food, that there's absolutely a that happens. That's, yeah. And so for me, that's what makes me feel home. Yeah, is that yeah. connection. Yeah. yeah, I I just, I could not agree with you more. I, I feel that so much about the work that, you know, that we do and how lucky we are to do it because it's, it helps us fuel these connections. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I want to ask you, <laughs> Now that we've said it's not so much about the food, I want to ask you just a little bit about the food, but I will make it work with what you just said, because another question I'm sure you get asked all the time is like, what recipe should I make from your new book? And oh, me, it depends so much on like circumstance, right? And what people like and stuff. So I'll ask you a few, I'm going to make up some scenarios and then just tell us which recipe from the new book you think would best fit the scenario. Does that sound good? No, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, so you um you are gonna have or someone is going to have three of their like close friends over for brunch, and they're they're not bringing their kids. This is their time to just be together and be like adults together. So it doesn't necessarily have to be kid friendly. Um, brunch like a group of like four people. What do you suggest? Okay. So I, I might make, depending on, on the season, um, I might make, uh, if they were coming tomorrow, there's still tomatoes in the <laughs> farmer's market. Are you still harvesting tomatoes? Um, we just finished, like last week. They're okay. done. We, st- we still have yeah. them at the farm stand. So I might make the ricotta tomato, no, the tomato tart, right? Which mm-hmm. is- that looks so good. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, I might make as a transition um, the pear and Conte um, tart. Mm-hmm. I might make uh, oh the the buttermilk molasses loaf. Oh, and, that looks amazing! Right, and it's so simple. It's you know just stir it in the bowl mm-hmm. and bake. But it's My one favorite. of the cakes. I love I love things that are edgy. So this could go with smoked salmon, mm-hmm. or it could go with honey and butter. Mm-hmm. So, but I would want, so yeah, something that has, you know, like, like the quiche, like the tomato tart. And I love brioche. I mean, yeah. <laughs> see, this is like the, well, and what if I decided, um, I mean, I think, one might the English muffins are so good. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm gonna give you another scenario. Yeah, I'm, gonna scenario. <laughs> I'm gonna save you from this one. Okay. Okay. On. You're um okay, let's say you're in the position of having a neighbor who um maybe your neighbor's just been through something really difficult. Maybe they've they've lost someone in their family, you know, they're going through a tough time. And you want to bake some. I'm going to say, I'm going to specify, you want to bake some cookies for them, drop them off with a note. You want to provide some comfort. What are you going to bake? You know, I might just make, I I didn't know where you were going and I had some other (laughs) ideas, but I think given that my neighbors had such a difficult time, um, I'm going, I would make just my classic chocolate chip cookies. They're delicious. 
they would they're immediately recognizable. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to wonder if I put an ingredient in mm -hmm. that she's not familiar with. Yeah. It just I, I think that opening that box, nice note, neighbor cares about you, cookies, cookies yeah. that I love. And that, you know, it's like even like the English muffins or recipes that we know and have seen for so long or foods that we buy ready-made those that we make if we can make versions of those mm -hmm. again, I somehow feel like they're like extra 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 special and um so chocolate chip cookies they seem they seem common mm -hmm. I happen to think mine are uncommon I think that they're really really good um, and so it would be the comfort of seeing something she knew mm -hmm. and the pleasure of having a surprise in the cookie. Yeah, I'd give yeah. her chocolate yeah. cookies. I, I, think that's, I think that's the right choice. Okay, maybe a, a bit of a happier situation. Someone has, you know- She's recovered. <laughs> Say it again. They've recovered. Yes. yes. They've, they've recovered. Yes. And, um, you know, it's, it's October. We are in, you know, New England and you have more apples than you know what to do with. There's so many apples. What are you going to do with all these apples? So I, I have a lot of things to do with the apples. So just to go back to where we started when I said I don't kind of, I don't know what my books are like until I get toward the end I was making the list that you make in the beginning of your project and I noticed that I had little like mini collections of recipes mm -hmm. so I had a lot of brioche recipes or recipes that you could make with brioche dough I had a lot of chocolate chip cookie recipes I had a lot, and so I made these sections called sweethearts and they had mm -hmm. like little parts. I had a lot of apple recipes. And mm -hmm. so I am ready for apple season. <laughs> I have, wait, I'm just going to read you the apple sweethearts. Mold butter apple pie. Yum. That's really nice. Apple galette. I love a galette. And I love it. You know, anybody who hasn't baked before, and a galette is always gorgeous. Mm -hmm. What you do to it. So it's mm -hmm. And it's got, I was making, I made a tart tatin and the, the, I, there's a really good tart tatin in the apple section. Um, but I, the first time I was working on this new way of doing it, I overcooked the apples. And so I made applesauce out of it. And so it was so good because you have the caramel flavor. Yeah and the apples so in this galette i give you the chance to use that i call it tatanized applesauce caramel applesauce under it uh, i love a, it there's a caramel apple crisp there's uh i'll never pronounce it right um zarlatka which is a polish apple cake mm -hmm. with right and so the crust the the dough for the crust makes the crust and then you save some of it and it becomes a crumb top. I love that. A two yeah. for one. There's the tatan, and there's an apple pen dowdy. And mm. I, think, I think we should all be making apple pen dowdy. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. What is it for so anyone who doesn't know? Apples, so it's it's apple pie without the pie in a way. <laughs> so it's all the goodness of the apples that you would put in a pie and you're juicy and flavorful and you, you put some sugar in there, not much. And then you can put any kind of dough over it. So I make mm -hmm. it and just cut it out into any shape, raggedy edge, higgledy piggledy. And then those pieces go on top. And so it bakes, once again, a dessert that is beautiful. Even mm -hmm. you're just, you've never done this before. And so it's like a deep dish pie with a better name. Mm -hmm. right? And you and you don't have to, um, it's like, I feel like it's a lot easier than making a pie. Yeah, because you're not, you're not lining the pan. You're not mm -hmm. in double crust. Though so I think there's such satisfaction in getting a pie built, yeah. just making it. But start with a pandemic if you haven't done this before. Um, 
I love that suggestion. I am where I live. I'm surrounded by apples and I'm just so glad to have all these recipes so I can use them up. Um, I, I, we are at the time for other people to ask questions. This has flown by Dory. I could happily talk to you for so many hours and I hope next time it is in person and just thank you for your wonderful work. And thanks for rooting for all of us and making us all just feel like we want to be in the kitchen. It's, it's really valuable. I love you. I love you too, Dory. This was just so great. And I just, I just love your yellow kitchen so much. It just makes me happy. (laughs) Thanks for inviting us into it. (laughs) Julia, you're not going anywhere because some of these questions are for both of you. Okay. Okay. I'm glad we've had the love fest. I'm all for the love fest. So we're going to keep going with that. Um, But speaking of questions about this current book, Dory, someone had a really fun question. They wanted to know what recipe gave you the most trouble Mm. and how did you solve the issues it was given you? I didn't. It's not in the book. So this is, no, this was- number 15. (laughs) This, no. So it was a recipe that I had made for years. I was making a Dutch baby, you know, a, a puff pancake. I made it for years and years and years. I was making a savory version, but I'd also made that for years and years. And I was really pleased with it until it didn't work. Until it just, it was as though a kitchen witch had flown in and said, I'm getting you, this is not. And so I tried it and finally I just gave up. I took it out of the book. Yeah, it was like harsh editing, you know. I kill your darlings. That darling. Maybe was, next time. It was Maybe. so good and so beautiful. I don't know what happened. Uh, another question um, you both, um, well, Dora, you were speaking about your family and Julia. I know in your beautiful Simply Julia book, you speak about family as well and some of the recipes you know, that came from family members. And an audience member wants to know, do any members of your family, and I'm going to expand it to friends and circles, adopted family, do you have people that cook for you? And if so, what, what are your favorites? that other people do for you? Or maybe the answer is no, they don't. <laughs> I hope you do, Dory. Well, I hope you do too. I was just, <laughs> no, but I was just thinking that any, I, it, there's not a favorite, I think. And I go back to the pleasure that I have making food for others. It's a joy to be invited to someone else's home and to eat at someone else's table and I don't it doesn't make any difference to me Michael's making signs what do you have to say however you have on several occasions had people serve you things and have become less reasonable that's right that's right yeah there have so Michael remember that there are people who've made food that I've loved Mm -hmm. and that have become recipes for me but I think anytime someone invites you into their home and cooks for you. You feel so well taken it's care It's the best. It's the right? best. Well, Michael makes bread, right? Famously. Yeah. yeah. So I have, this book is actually my first, like morning to midnight, all mm-hmm. per, since, well, since 2006 and baking from my home to yours. And I have bread in the book, but Michael's bread is baguettes and crusty you know like sourdough loaves mine are more like loaf Mm -hmm. breads and I think of them as breads that bakers make yeah yeah I I get that (laughs) Julia what about you oh I I I have a lot of people in my life who love to cook I think it's probably what keeps us close family and friends and my wife Grace cooks she she recently said to me I asked her I said do you like to cook and she was like I'll do it. <laughs> she likes to eat, but she, you know, sometimes I, I cook almost every day, but sometimes I just don't feel like it. And she absolutely steps in all the time. Um, and my father loves to cook and I love eating at my parents' house and my closest friends. I think the reason we have had such a long friendship, I have a close group of friends, um, there's four of us. And I think the reason we all just stick together so much and 
is because we all love to cook and we cook for each other and we cook together when we can. We're now very spread out kind of across the world, but when we're together, we're, we're cooking, we're talking about food. Our group text message is just about like what they're packing their kids for lunch and like do we have ideas and what's everyone having for dinner and so everything Dory said I agree with so much I I feel the love when I cook for people it's how I express that love and it is so nice to be the recipient of it and I'll eat anything I am like (laughs) I think I'm a very easy person to cook for I'm so grateful (laughs) I love that. We have a question here about ingredients. So um, Dory, an audience member would like to know, what do you bring back from Paris to the USA? And also vice versa, is there anything you bring from the US to Paris? That's yes. such a good question. So I used to bring like a suitcase full <laughs> of stuff from Paris back to America. I also brought a box of olive oil that broke. No. Um, no. Everybody, everybody's luggage was coming down the conveyor. Sliding. <laughs> slippery. And yeah, I just oh said, God. not mine, not mine. <laughs> but I don't, I actually find that I can get most of what I want right here. I bring back, there's a great little shop, JD2. And I buy fleur de sel from them. I buy peppercorns because they have such an interesting selection. Um, I might buy hazelnuts from them, um, but mostly I don't. I, I don't bring back food anymore the way I used to. I bring American flour mm. to Paris. I always travel with a five-pound sack of flour. Okay. Do you can I ask? Do you bring that? for testing recipes or do you bring that just for general baking? So I never, I often, I mean, I'll find, you know, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll have an idea when I'm in Paris and I'll start playing with it in Paris. And I want that flour because the the, the difference in the flour is is noticeable. Mm -hmm. I'll use that flour, but I never ever create a recipe in France and then have it published. It Mm -hmm. always, comes back to America and gets tested with, you know, all American ingredients. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm going to forget that olive oil story ever. And in <laughs> fact, somebody, somebody in the question and answer asked about a kitchen mishap. And I'm going to, I'm going to say that that sounds to me like the, that was, like, that, was <laughs> that was a mishap of um, exciting proportions for all involved. Um, a question on, Flavor, what's a surprising or unique flavor combination that works really well together that perhaps we wouldn't think of? And I know this book is so interesting because you do do some unusual um, things that people may associate with sweet and now you're making it savory. Yeah, so I think I like, I like to take a flavor that you're not always accustomed to having and make it the star. So, um, like I have a, 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 there's a cookie recipe that stars star and nice. Mm-hmm. And that's a spice that I love that you don't often find in sweets. You find it often in Asian dishes or cooking meat. Um, and so it's fun to take that ingredient and flip it, make it sweet and give it a starring role. Um, we talked about the miso maple um, loaf. So good. Fun to take miso, which you don't think of as sweet, and to use it in, actually, the inspiration for that recipe came from salmon, which it sounds so weird, but I mean, I was making a salmon dish that was glazed with miso and maple, and I thought, I can make a cake out of that. Mm-hmm. I love that. So, I like I like finding an ingredient and, and turning it on its head a little bit. Julia? Oh, I'm just nodding because I I take so much pleasure in that type of moment. Um, But in terms of ingredient pairs, I don't know. I would turn to Dory. (laughs) The only, the thing that popped into my head, I don't know. I feel like I'm not, I think you're really good at that. I, I don't, I don't know that that's something I excel at, but I, my family forever, every year at Thanksgiving, we have this tradition 
that is we start the meal with a roasted red pepper soup and it has pears in it and you don't really taste so much pear i wouldn't call it like a pepper and pear soup but there's like a couple of pears in there it all gets pureed it's like peppers roasted peppers some like potatoes carrots and pears but it adds this like sweetness and it's so lovely and it's the kind of thing that i forget that most people don't have this at thanksgiving it's like this random thing my family has um but i love it and it's really really nice that combination of of pepper and pear is really lovely but it also adds texture and just mm-hmm. to, yeah so i mean it, it's that balance so i have a recipe for financier which i make in little mini muffins mm-hmm. and so that's traditionally made with almond flour sometimes hazelnut and i make it with pistachio ground pistachios and I added a little matcha and I thought I was adding it for color. And then as I worked on the recipe, I was also, I realized I was also adding it for getting that edge, mm-hmm. tiny little bit of bitterness that offsets the sweetness or, um, so I, I, I've done for the first time in 20 some odd years, um, a new version of the world peace cookie. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's a chocolate cookie that has fleur de sel and chopped chocolate in it. And this new version has Piedmont d'Espelette. So it has a little bit of, or cayenne. So it has that little bit of spice. It has cocoa nibs. It has dried raspberries and it has a little rye flour. And I worked and worked and worked. I didn't want it to be a gimmick. I wanted all of the flavors to come together. I wanted it to change the texture. And yeah, it was it's pretty good. Yeah, they look wonderful. Delicious. They look really good. That's gonna be my kids' first experiment because they are big world peace cookie fans. Story, <laughs> Julia, we've come to the end of our hour together. I cannot thank you. Blue bye. <laughs> Such a delight. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, you can support both of these amazing chefs by heading over to our website and picking up a copy or two or three for holiday gifting for all of your friends and family. And we're just so grateful. Thank you for bringing this light into our lives tonight and have a beautiful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Julia. Everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone.